Question number three is about percentage. We have to uh, calculate, uh, let's see here, after a price increase of 5.5%, the cost of a computer is this much. What was the cost of the co computer before the price increase? Uh, why don't we use algebra to solve this? Why don't we say let x equal uh, the cost of the computer. Now you see, if I would just write that, that isn't very precise. Do I mean the cost of the computer before the price increase or after the price increase? There's actually no use for me to call x the cost of the computer after the price increase because I already know that number, right? We only want to let x be something that we don't know that we would like to know. So why don't we let x be what we want to find here, namely the cost of the computer before the price increase. Um, now the, the next question would be, if the x is the cost of the computer before the price increase, and we perform a price increase of 5.5%, how much extra money is going to be added on top of that? Well, the, uh, the, uh, the extra amount from the price increase would be what? How can we figure that out? Well, I would, uh, what I would do is I would change this to a decimal, which means dividing it by 100 and we get 0 0.055. This is called a rate, right? The per this is the percentage version. This is called a rate. The rate uh, is nice because we can use that in calculations. So if the way we should do it is if we multiply the rate by the original cost, that'll give us the extra amount that's added on the uh, top of the, of the original price. So this is the um, extra amount of money that needs to be paid on top of the original price. And what I think that we should do is that if we add these two quantities, we're going to get the new price, right? So if I write something like this, original price, um, original, the original price plus, plus the price increase, equals the um, new price. The original price, as we said, is just x. The amount of extra money that we have to pay is this quantity. And the new price, we're told, it's 582.36. All right, so now that we've, we have a simple algebra equation to solve now, um, there's really a one here, right? So one plus one x plus this is just one point zero five five x equals that. And then to solve this we just divide both sides by the number in front of x. These cancel and we're left with x. And what is this side gonna be? Five eighty two point thirty six divided by one point zero five five. Five hundred and fifty two dollars. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'll, I won't write the dollar sign yet. But just as a, like a side note, you know, if, if you're given a word problem in English and it's kind of phrased as, a, in a, as not a mathematical type problem, uh, you kind of should give a sentence as an answer. So I'll just give a, a quick little simple sentence. It doesn't have to be fancy, just a simple sentence. Um, just say the cost before the price increase. is $552. And here's where I'll put the dollar sign. So this would be my answer for that one. All right, so I wrote down a lot of stuff here, but it's really easy what's going on here. If you have something and you want to, the price is gonna be increased, you just multiply that quantity, the dollar value it by the rate. The rate is just a percentage changed to a decimal. And if you add those two, you'll get your new price. And then we just do some simple algebra there. All right, so what about B though? B is actually even easier. Um, 
if we do 20%, if we spend 20% of our income on rent and our income is 1500 uh, all we have to do for this is find what 20 per, 23% of 1500 is. So let's do that. 23% of $1,500. Well, I like to, I like to think, first of all, like we said, let's change this to a rate. So 0 0.23 of, in mathematics of kind of means multiply, all right? So when you say of 1,500, we should be multiplying there. And 1,500 just stays the same. And this is, just do that in the calculator. So 0 0.23 times 1,500. So that's 345. So like I said, we should really write a little simple sentence. The amount spent on rent is $345. So that's, uh, that was a pretty easy question. All right, number four here. We have uh, some, looks like this first one is about an equation of a line. It passes through this point and has this for its slope. Well, I think the equation I would want to use here would be the y minus y zero equals m times x minus x zero. This equation is specially designed for this setup right here. Because we're given the slope, that's our m value. We're going to plug that in. And this point here, this is our x0, y0 point. So x0 is 2, y0 is 1. And x and y just stay as x and y, right? So let's fill everything in. We're going to leave x and y alone, but x0, y0, and m are going to be filled in with these numbers up here. So I replace y0 by 1. I replace m by 2. And x stays as x, and x0 was replaced by 2. So that's basically done now. I just need to simplify it a little bit. Why don't I multiply this 2 across? So I get 2x minus 4. I'm going to bring this minus 1 over to isolate for y. So I get 2x minus 4. When I bring the minus 1 over, it becomes plus 1. And so we end up with 2x minus 3. Remember, the when they talk about the... Uh, Usually, usually an equation of a line, you write y equals mx plus b. So um, even though it's not asked, we know now that the y-intercept of this line is at 0, comma negative 3. Okay, so the next one is uh, to do with graphing an absolute value equation. Okay, well, I just maybe would like you to remember something that if you have an absolute value equation that looks like this, the vertex of this, the which is like the, the pointy part, remember the absolute value graph, it looks like a V, right? The V is either opening up or opening down. The vertex is at H comma K, right? If A is positive, then the graph is gonna be opening upwards like that. And if A is negative, the graph will be opening downwards like this. All right. Um, for us, what is the equation? Y equals absolute value of X plus one. So Y equals, okay, well, I'm gonna maybe erase this because we don't need it. Just remember it though. We do need it, but it's just, um, it's not necessarily part of the solution that we should actually write down. So for us, this is our equation, right? Absolute value of x plus 1. Why don't I rewrite it as this? I can write um, x plus 1 plus 0. I know that's kind of weird. But the reason I do that is because I now know that my h is negative 1 and my k is 0, right? So that means the vertex is at negative 1, 0. Remember in that formula, it's x minus h. So maybe it would be helpful if I wrote this as x minus negative 1. Or maybe that just makes it more confusing. But it really is the same. And when I write it like this, I hope it's more obvious to you that h is negative 1. For some, student, for some reason, students always get confused on that. 
Um, just maybe one way to think about it is if you look at that and you think H should be one, um, it really should be opposite to what you're thinking is. So H is actually negative one here. But the K value is actually what we intuitively think it should be. <laughs> so I hope that makes sense. We know the vertex is there. You know the coefficient in front of here is a one. So we know the absolute value graph opens upwards. So I think the, we can roughly draw the graph now. Let's say this is negative one. This would be one. Um, negative two. So we know the vertex is right there and the V opens upwards, right? Uh, also the slope of this line here is one. We know that because that's a one. Maybe an easier way to see it is what if I put X equals zero in here? What if we make just like a little table of values? Uh, if I put X equals zero in here, I get the absolute value of zero plus one, which is the absolute value of one, which is one. So I know that point is on there. Um, what if I put negative, well, I, I'll put negative one in, sure. I kind of already know the answer is zero, but negative one plus one is zero. Absolute value of zero is zero. So I have that point. What if I put negative two in? Negative two plus one is negative one, but the absolute value of negative one is actually positive one. So we're up there. And I think our graph is beginning to form here. So we have, uh, we have a good enough graph, I think. Why don't we label those points? Uh, what I'll do is just erase that and write zero comma one there. And there we go. So there's the graph of that. Um, just remember, you're always allowed to generate a few points using a table of values in your function rule to uh, really nail down how your graph looks. Finally, we have to do this last question. Um, I'm just going to recopy it here so I don't have to scroll up and down every time. Just go down here. So this is the question we have to do now. Um, you know, before we had a line that was in the form y equals mx plus b. That's called point or a slope intercept form. This one's a little bit different. This is really a line just as well, except it's uh, in general form. And we want to change it to slope intercept form. And slope intercept form is just like we saw before, the y equals mx plus b. So for this first question, really all we're asked is isolate for y. Get y by itself on one side. So let's do that. Um, why don't we take this positive 2x and this positive 6, move them over. We'll leave the 3y alone, though. And when I move those over, they change sign to the minus, right? Okay. Now, let's divide every single thing by 3 here. Uh, this is a little bit messy. Let me fix that. Um, 3 over 3 is 1. So 1y, one we just get y. And that's what I wanted, right? I wanted y by itself, so that's good. Uh, I just want to point out something pretty important here, pretty useful. I kind of, you, you guys know that, you, I hope you know that these are the same, right? Minus 2x all over 3 is the same as minus 2 thirds x. Sometimes it's useful to write it like this. Sometimes it's useful to write it like that. I would prefer to write it like this in this scenario right now because it makes it obvious that m being the number in front of x, m is going to be negative 2 thirds here, right? And 6 over 3, that's actually a, just an integer, right? 6 divided by 3 is just 2. So there we go. There's our formula in uh, slope-intercept form. But really, these lines in this general form is the same as this line in slope-intercept form. All right, so the first part is done. Now we have to sketch the graph and find the x and y intercepts. I think I would rather find the x and y intercept first and then sketch the graph. Because if I know the x and y intercepts, the, the graph is going to be very quick. The way I sometimes like to set that up is I, I do x, y like this, like a table of values. I put a 0 there and I put a 0 there. Whatever number goes here, I'm going to attain the uh, y-intercept there. 0 comma whatever will be the y-intercept. And whatever number I find here will be the x-intercept. Um, now, to find these numbers here, I could use either equation. I could use this one here, or I could use this one here. To tell you the truth, to do the intercepts, I would rather work with this one. 
because this one has fractions in it and I don't want to bother with fractions too much. Well, the truth is uh, by looking at this, I actually already know the y-intercept, right? It's negative two. So I know there's a negative two goes there, but let's just pretend I didn't notice that. What I would like to just show you is, um, let's say I take my original general form equation and let's say I want to find this number here, okay? That means I should let x be zero in this equation and see what that force is y to be. So let's see how that works. Two times zero is just zero, so I just get three y plus six is zero. If I bring the six to the other side, I get negative six. And um, divide both sides by negative, by positive three. So I get y is negative two. I actually knew that, right? So let's put negative two in there, that's fine. Now, to find the x-intercept, we're gonna do the same thing. We'll take our general form equation. I could just as well take this equation as well, but I'm gonna, I would have to deal with some fractions and everybody prefers to avoid fractions if they can. Um, we're gonna let y be zero in here, so we get two x plus three times zero plus six equals zero. Once we solve this for x, we're gonna know what number goes there. So two x plus six is equal to zero, two x is equal to negative six. Divide both sides by two. Six, negative six divided by two is negative three. So we found our, we, we know negative three goes here. So what that means is that the, uh, the x-intercept is, let's give it as a coordinate. Is the x-intercept this first one or is it the second one? It's actually the second one, right? Negative three comma zero. And the y-intercept, we know it's the x-intercept because this point actually lies on the x-axis, right? An x-intercept better be on the x-axis and a y-intercept better be on the y-axis. Um, a y-intercept, the y-intercept is this first one, zero comma negative two, which is obvious from this, uh, the value of b here is negative two, right? So we've answered those questions and now that we know those two intercepts, it's gonna be very easy to, to draw the graph. I can do that right here. So let's say this is negative one, negative two, negative three, negative one, negative two. Um, the graph passes through here at negative two and passes through here at negative three comma zero. So here's our graph. Not that straight, but just imagine. Um, why don't I write it on top? So this is negative three comma zero. And this is uh, zero comma negative two. And of course, this is negative one, negative two, and negative one, positive one. And there's our graph. So as you see, once we know the intercepts, it's very easy to draw the graph. So that completes this question.